But we found out in December, as I covered in the World Affairs Brief, when there was a major financial crisis where the banks were out of reserves, they weren't going to make their minimum requirements, they're going to get hit with million-dollar penalties and things. And rather than let the banks sell the reserves, the Fed came in with a major bailout and just shoveled trillion, you know, half a trillion dollars to the banks. To pat. And what I figured, what I analyzed in the World Affairs Brief is the Fed would love to pull the plug partially on the economy in order to defeat Donald Trump, but they don't dare do it. So f- big is this bubble. So big and potentially dangerous is this bubble that we're living in, this stock market bubble, that they cannot afford, I believe, to pull it down to defeat Donald Trump, lest they lose control of the entire inflationary bubble. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back to Reluctant Preppers. We have a returning guest who's always very popular with our viewers and they have submitted a ton of questions ahead of him. This is Joel Skousen. He is the uh, editor of the World Affairs Brief. He's also the author of Strategic Relocation and of The Secure Home. Joel, thanks for joining us this Monday, February 17, 2020. It's always good to be with you, Dunnigan. I appreciate your uh, candor and your interviewing style. It's always a pleasure. We've, we've had so many comments submitted that there's no possible way we can do service to them all, but one theme that runs through all of them that I wanted to get you to weigh in on was about Everybody's asking, when are you going to come out with updated versions of your books? And um, specifically about strategic relocation, people are concerned about the rapidly changing landscape of liberty and uh, the, the risks that are present and the political shifts and tides that are changing in our country and how those will affect people picking the right place to live. Um, other things that they're concerned about changing, perhaps, it has to do with climate. And it's interesting. Some people are concerned things are going to be getting colder. Some people are think, thinking things are going to be getting hotter. But basically, they're wondering what is changing and what should they be aware of if maybe you could recap some of your classic recommendations of uh, prime uh, relocation targets and what are the principles. I'm guessing the principles probably haven't changed as much, but then you could bring us up to date with your latest findings on what is changing on the landscape of our country that people need to be aware of. Yeah, that's a big question, uh, Dunnigan. Um, The uh, strategic relocation, the third edition, um, most of it says copyright 2010, but we have been updating each printing ever since. And so the last update was 2016. Still, you know, it's enough out of date that um, uh, we are, I'm working right now on the fourth edition and it's going to be out um, mid-year here. And the, the problem now is that once things start to change rapidly in terms of gun control laws, for example, you've got cities doing gun bans now and that's got to be almost impossible to track or to rate in terms of a state. Um, these are happening, of course, in democratic-controlled states. So the principle is general that if you're in a, um, you know, a state controlled by Democrats or it's going that way, like Virginia went, all of a sudden all hell can break loose in terms of your rights. Uh, and you have to get very, very active as the gun rights people did in Virginia to try to to uh, to stop that. But, you know, they can thumb their nose at the public. They don't care. Uh, the Democrats have a rabid hatred of all things uh, self-defense and guns, even though they'll, you know, say differently. But um, the basic problem that we're dealing with is still, in terms of principles, population density. As, as the country continues to push for more urbanization, Agenda 21 and and, uh, and that's kind of slowed down in terms of the federal government pushing that. But there's all kinds of well-heeled, well-financed private groups now, non-profit groups that are pushing things. In Utah, for example, we have Envision Utah, which is nothing but an Agenda 21 uh, left wing uh, trying to overturn all the local um, land use planning laws and have statewide land use planning like we had in Oregon. 
I mean, come from Oregon, and I'll tell you, that was a disaster. No matter what you wanted to do at a local city, when you have statewide laws, the, s- the city simply couldn't do anything. And, you know, they would say, well, go to Salem and, and, and change the law. Well, with a democratic-controlled legislature, that's literally impossible. So you've got to avoid all of this mass control from the state capital. Uh, Democratic states are generally uh, 50, or I mean, at least 40 to 45 percent conservative in the rural areas. But in the, it, it doesn't take but one or two major urban areas that are controlled by the left. And that's usually done because they have bought up the major newspapers in all the urban areas and they're controlled by Democrats or globalists, pro-government shills, uh, and they continue to pump people with, uh, you know, the socialist agenda. And then you couple that with the public school system, which is producing. I mean, since President Trump was uh, elected, I estimate we have now probably 20 million new socialist voters in the United States graduated from high school and colleges that are preaching nothing but big government programs and anti-Trump. I mean, they're literally anti-Trump. And so what I look to in strategic relocation, because I'm never going to be able to keep up to date with how fast things are changing. Okay, so you're going to have to, your listeners are going to have to revert to the principles. And these are the basic principles. One, you got to avoid high density population areas. And that means the entire East Coast uh, is pretty well out. Uh, now, in the book, the third edition of Strategic Relocation, I do talk about how to, if you can't leave the area because of family, because of, of job, there are ways to ameliorate the damage. But you've got to remember it, you're still going to be at risk. But for example, if you've got to be in a major metro area, then get to the periphery of that major metro area so that if you have to flee, if you have to get to a retreat, you're not in the middle, you are on the outskirts, and it's easier to, uh, to escape in, in those regions. And also avoid trying to get out of Dodge on the main traffic routes. You want to pre-plan, if you ever have to leave, you want to pre-plan the little urban, or not urban, but the little suburban routes. You'll make more time going through suburban residential areas than you will if you try to get to the main four-lane feeder roads or secondary roads going out. You also have to be aware that beltways, that every urban area has beltways, those are like a, a moat. Uh, it's it's a, a complete fence around the city. You can't get past that beltway except in two or three areas or roads that have a pass through the beltway, either overpass or underpass, that is not associated with an entrance or exit to the freeway. Those will be clogged. The entrance and exits will be clogged. Only the bypass roads that go over or under that without an exit, and you just check Google Maps, you just follow the beltway around, uh, and you can see which ones don't have an entry or an exit. If that's the route you want to plan on in order to get out uh, of an urban area. But there are lots of rural areas that are safe in the south, for example. Um, and there's a lot in the, the Cumberland area, the Tennessee, Kentucky area. Uh, so, you know, it's still outside commuting different di- distance to the major cities. For example, Atlanta is one of the biggest, fastest growing metropolitan areas in the United States now. And the traffic is just horrendous. I did a, uh, my sons and I did a high security residence uh, in North Georgia, and we had to commute to the architect's office down there in in Atlanta. And it was an all day job just to get into Atlanta and get out again. And when the snow or ice hit, there was an ice storm one winter and things just came down to a, to a crawl. I mean, literally everybody was running out of food. Nobody was prepared. Uh, That's what happens in an urban area. Now, Think what happens if you have a coronavirus type uh, escape happen in the United States, um, you know, where you have a quarantine situation where people can't go out, where you don't dare go to work, etc. You know, it's in the urban areas where you're going to get where these diseases will propagate the most rapidly. Because in the outdoors, in the rural areas, even if a person who's infected gets outdoors, 
those viruses don't last long in the in the sunshine and the free air. They get deactivated fairly quickly, but not in urban areas, not in closed spaces. So plan on not going to school, not going to work, not going to church. Um, that's you've really got to understand that urban densities are really your greatest nightmare. Now, in terms of the you know, a lot of questions I get is, where's the safest place? You know, just tell me the one or two states are the safest place. And I would do a disservice to people if I were to do that, because it doesn't matter. I mean, first of all, safety is inversely proportional to the number of people. Now, there's the safest place in the United States is probably out in the middle of the Nevada desert that's 200 miles from civilization. But you try to build a retreat 200 miles from civilization and have to commute five or six hours to get to a Home Depot. And you're going to say, I made a big mistake. There's no way I can afford to do this. And you're not... You just gave me a flashback to when we uh, moved to a suburban uh, neighborhood uh, shortly after getting married. And uh, I declare I kept the local building supply store in business for the the two and a half years that we lived there. I think I personally could take credit for that. (laughs) But you see, there's a compromise to every location. In other words, safety is inversely proportional to people. So, but you have to find a, an optimum compromise distance away from people so that you can get to the store, that you can get to repair facilities, so that UPS actually delivers to your, uh, to your address. And they're not going to deliver out in the middle of the Nevada desert on, down a dirt road. And so... The point is, you've got family to think about. Is your wife going to live in a remote location? Do you have schooling? Do you have grandchildren to visit? There's so many conflicting things. How about your job and work? Even if you're independently wealthy, if you have all the money in the world, and I've got clients who have millions of dollars, who have built million dollars retreat uh, that they live in full time, with full self-sufficiency, generators, solar, um, Uh, greenhouses, uh, underground greenhouses with grow lights and all that stuff. But the technology is so complex that even though we deliver a manual to all of our clients, a manual of about two or three inches thick, they still call me on the telephone to want to troubleshoot the problem. And I have to tell them, well, go to the manual. No, no, that just takes too long. I said, look, in a crisis, I'm not going to be here. A repairman, a solar person isn't going to be here. It's too technical for me. I mean, I have to have an electrician or my specialty electrician to help out. And they're in Texas. They're not going to be anywhere near where you are. But you see, wealthy people are very reluctant to get down to the do-it-yourself stuff, which is extremely essential for self-sufficiency. If you just don't know how to do it yourself, you're not going to be able to depend on, on, on other people. I have a lot of people say, Tell me where there's a retreat community that I can join. Mm. Well, I've been consulting in this area for 40 years, and I've never seen a retreat community survive. They always break up due to infighting because survival-oriented people don't get along that well. They're all independent, hard-nosed-minded people. And even religious communities have differences in doctrine, and they split up, etc. So There really is no guarantee for that, and that's why I recommend that people have an informal network of friends and relatives and other people that you you get to know through going to conservative organizations, going to church, going to some clubs or other things that you have in common, and you determine who you have things in common with. Then you start to develop. You don't meet. You don't form a survival club. uh, You don't share your preparation things. You just know who you can trust that you get along with and those people will help out when you call on them uh, when you finally organize this thing and the worst thing you can do is, of course join a militia because they're all infiltrated by the federal government so the quickest way to get yourself on a red list is to join a militia but so informal networks are are the way to go one principle you just established um echo something that we had experienced in our own personal lives. 
where we had tried going on uh, even joint vacations with another family. We've tried it a couple different ways and where we tried to do everything together and stay synchronized in every planning of our day and everything. We were both, we were all going crazy by about the third day. It reminded me of, uh, of uh, Benjamin Franklin's quote about fish and visitors smell in three days. Um, but, <laughs> but when we did a loosely coupled uh, where, we, where we go to a common place with someone and they do what they want to do and we would do what we want to do and we say, hey, we'll meet Jeff for supper tomorrow night or something like that. And people have a lot of a lot of independence and a lot of liberty and it's and it's uh, more there are touch points there where you you share certain experiences but you don't try to keep it in lockstep much more uh survival much more uh realistic for everyone involved go ahead now what i was saying in terms of general relocation you want a state to find a state that's not near the eastern seaboard preferably where you have lots of rural area and it's amazing how a lot of the rural areas have problems. For example, some of the highest recommended areas in Tennessee, uh, south of Nashville, became infested with uh, meth labs because they were escaping law enforcement. So they went out into the rural countries. And so you had a real meth lab problem everywhere in these very good strategic relocation counties. So those types of things change. And you have to have your ear to the ground to be able to know that. But you want to be away from where the subdivisions are growing out of. Uh, for example, Nashville used to have some very, very nice areas an hour's drive away from Nashville, and they're all subdivisions now. And so those areas became compromised. And so it's important, actually, you know, your, your best bet in terms of finding areas that are not going to get overrun by subdivisions to get into more drier and desert-like uh, climates where subdivisions generally don't go out in those areas. They, they tend to, uh, you know, want to be in the horse country of Kentucky and other places like that. And so you can find a lot of good retreat areas in Texas. One of the problems with Texas is though, it's, it's, it's edging towards a democratic state now with all the Latinos that are moving into the state. And once it becomes a Democrat controlled state, you know, you could lose a lot of liberties, which are now still prevalent uh, in Texas. My two top rated states still will be in the next book, uh, Utah and Idaho, because they are the most conservative and they have the most conservative population base with and low residential density, too. And they're also, you know, five to six hundred miles from any major population areas outside of Salt Lake City, which is not recommended the center of that that area. But, you know, people trying to walk from the L.A. basin up to Utah, you know, you're talking about 700 miles over trackless desert. It's not going to happen. It's 800 miles across the Nevada desert from San Francisco. It's not going to happen. It's 900 miles from the Portland area and 1,200 miles from Seattle through the eastern Oregon deserts and the Washington deserts and the Idaho deserts. It's just not going to happen. Um, you're going to have to deal with some social unrest among the urban areas that exist in those uh, highest rated states. And may I say that even those two states, Utah and Idaho, are getting more liberal. I mean, they were arch conservative, and now you have mainstream, quote, conservative uh, governors who are trying to please the world. And, and so they're buying into a lot of the you know worldly tolerance and things and uh, asking for more refugees to be sent to their states, for example, thinking that they're being tolerant or Christian, not realizing that there's a very evil agenda to flooding conservative states with illegal aliens and refugees. But still, every state in the union is getting more liberal. And so on balance, relative to one another, Utah and Idaho are still gonna be the most conservative two states and the, and the highest recommendations. Montana's going democratic, you know, has some beautiful retreat country in there, but uh, it's, you know, still, you know, half and half right now, but it's probably going to be Democratic in the next election, fully Democratic, and you're going to have to really watch out. Wyoming's going Democratic. Uh, Colorado's gone Democratic. It's like New York now, every bad piece of legislation in the world. Colorado's being downrated from a four-star state to a two-star state in the new edition. And uh, so... Things are not looking good, and, um, and that's why you have to understand the principle of finding a safe micro-location within a generally safe state. Now, what I mean by that is you want a state that's going to stay conservative over the next 10 or 15 years, and 
and there are, you know, at least a dozen states that are going to stay conservative in the next uh, 10 years. But within those states, you're going to want to find a location that's within the compromised distance you need to be away from a Home Depot, away from major shopping, away from a job and work or visiting grandkids. And that's generally 45 minutes to an hour. You don't want to be closer than 45 minutes to the urban area. You want to be able to commute a little bit. And one of the purposes of that in a retreat, especially a full-time one, is that when famine comes, which surely will come when World War III comes toward the end of this decade, preceded by an EMP strike, there's going to be famine for at least a year in this country. And you try growing a garden in a suburban backyard, and those tomatoes are going to be plucked before they're even yellow. I mean, it's just the fact of life. The, the fruit trees will be stripped of green fruit. And you don't want to be shooting people just because they're, they're hungry. So it's greater wisdom to get further out, at least an hour out of a, 45 minutes to an hour out of a, a suburban area, and then where you can have a real rural garden farm homestead that you can survive and do a retreat uh, there. But it should be off of a major road. You shouldn't be on a, ma on a secondary road, a paved road where people can see your property. Because when people are coming out of the city, they're going to be on those secondary roads. They're going to be running out of gas. They're going to be stopping at the houses they can see. So you want to pick a micro location that is down a lane that through a wooded area or something where you cannot see the house from a major a secondary paved road. That's very, very important. And, you know, people say, how far from a freeway should it be? Well, it's not really that crucial. You, I've located retreat things a mile from a freeway but you just can't see it from the freeway and you can't even find it because it follows that of being off down a winding lane and a dirt road or a gravel road where it's very hard to see. So those are the basic principles of how people can do it even with the outdated third edition that's still out there. And I cover all those principles in the book. Very good. Um, Follow-up question, and I alluded to this earlier during the intro, and that has to do with uh, climatic shifts. And I am not going to necessarily ask you to commit to what your opinion is about the direction of climate, although if you have one, we're, we're always interested to that. But the principle is still the question, and that is uh, Sandy Phillips asks, what does Joel think about crop failures due to the solar minimum that we are entering? Or you could turn that around and others have asked, what do we think about uh, growing crops in, in a rising temperature environment? So either way, first of all, you can tell us whether you do have an opinion about which direction temperatures may or may not be headed. But in, in, any, in any regard, how can people plan ahead for the potential for extreme weather and how it might affect their ability to grow food? Well, we are headed for a solar minimum, so there's going to be solar cooling, and that's why they're concentrated on climate change rather than climate warming, because, um, you know, the, it's all over the map depending on who distorts the data. But I'll tell you, the, the climate change people, they have no shame about uh, altering the data. I mean, it's incredible. When you read the people who really understand climate, the ones that are censored in the news media, and they talk about, you know, the, I mean, like Glacier National Park had to take down this yeah. sign, you know, that said that, you know, this glacier is going to be gone by, what was it? Uh, 2020. 2020. And it's still yeah. going strong. Uh, but there are microclimates all around the world. And, but generally, the earth is going to be cooling. And they're going to blame that on, on climate change, of course, and they'll ride that to the bank. The point is it will not uh, end in, in, in crop failures. Uh, the solar cooling minimum that we've experienced in the past uh, two or 300 years uh, has not uh, resulted in major crop failures. So I wouldn't really worry about that. I'd worry much more about GMO crops and what it does to the damage to your intestinal tract and other things. It's, and even wheat, it's hard to find wheat, you know, that hasn't had glyphosate sprayed on it, round up to kill it uniformly so they can harvest it without any green kernels and things. And um, so you want to get Kamut, you know, a, a natural wheat, uh, a heritage brand wheat that has not been used uh, with Roundup to, to harvest it, things like that. Now, in terms of global warming, if we do have a warming trend, remember that the sun produces 99% of the climate change that we we are deal with. Man's input is just puny. Uh, you know, you can go through the data and show that, uh, you know, we had a major warming cycle before carbon emissions even started here. And so you really can't blame those things on that. But 
The solar uh, output of the sun is the major thing that uh, has to do with global warming. So I really discount that in terms of a major threat that you ought to be dealing with. Uh, the biggest threat that we're dealing with in the future is going to be uh, war. And believe me, it's going to—it's not economic collapse. There's a whole bunch of gurus that keep talking economic collapse. They've been doing that since 2010. They've been wrong every year. And, uh, you know, even I expected the, the Fed to pull down the economy to help defeat Donald Trump this year. But we found out in December, as I covered in the World Affairs Brief, when there was a major financial crisis where the banks were out of reserves, they weren't going to make their minimum requirements, they're going to get hit with million-dollar penalties and things. And rather than let the banks sell the reserves, the Fed came in with a major bailout and just shoveled trillion, you know, half a trillion dollars to the banks. To pass. And what I figured, what I analyzed in the World Affairs Brief is the Fed would love to pull the plug partially on the economy in order to defeat Donald Trump, but they don't dare do it. So f big is this bubble, so big and potentially dangerous is this bubble that we're living in, this stock market bubble, that they cannot afford, I believe, to pull it down to defeat Donald Trump lest they lose control of the entire inflationary bubble. Uh, so I don't think we're going to see an economic collapse. By the way, you never get an economic collapse um, without war. Uh, you get economic downturns, you get recessions, even the Great Depression was only 25% unemployment. And we have a lot more reserves nowadays than they had. The, when people were out of jobs, they didn't have anything in the cupboard in those days. They lived in shanties and other things, and they had to go to the soup line. People have two or three TVs, you know, three cars, and I'm talking about the poor, you know. And so there's an awful lot of reserves that people have. I'm not saying that there it wouldn't be hard on them because they're we have a very weak and soft populace nowadays that isn't going to do well in any crisis, but. Um, I'm just saying it's uh, it's not going to be a collapse. A collapse only comes when people cannot go to work, as in a coronavirus place in China, and China's economy is in collapse mode right now. Satellites show that pollution uh, levels in China are the lowest they've ever been by about half because nobody's driving. They've put a clamp down on transportation. The city of Wuhan looks like a ghost town of 13 million people. Nobody's driving. And, uh, you know, how long can you last like that? Executives of companies who have uh, factories in China can't travel there lest they be exposed to a two-week quarantine coming back in. Nothing's happening in China. And I'll tell you, it's really going to be bad economically for that. And think that's what happens when you have an EMP strike in a country, you know, and where you have a, a nuclear strike in a country where you can't go to work where even the policemen aren't going to work because they're back behind, uh, you know, uh, protecting their families from the social unrest that's going to be there. So it's very, very important to understand what the threats are. The big threat, I believe, is World War III coming toward the end of the next decade with an EMP strike that takes down the grid. And when that happens, it's like going from day to night. We'll be relatively fat, dumb, and happy still uh, with government bailouts, going up until that time. But when it happens, even the government's not going to be able to bail people out. So you're going to be on your own. People really need to seriously prepare. And remember, preparations and companies that deal in preparation have almost all suffered tremendously since the election of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Emergency mm -hmm. Essentials had a 90% drop in sales the first three months after Donald Trump was elected. So much so they couldn't even pay the rent on their huge warehouses. Nitro Pack went out of business because of Donald Trump. People thought he's going to save us. He's not going to drain the swamp. Sincere as he might want to do that, not going to be able to do that. So I must emphasize that you cannot wait until the crisis to start to prepare. Now, I know your audience has done a lot of preparations, but there's a lot more that everybody needs to do. Uh, a question here of a new type, and that is we have uh, one of the comments from a viewer, but also we've been uh, reached out personally from, a, from another viewer. Uh, and Debbie Nugent here asks, what is the best place for a single woman to relocate for the upcoming upheaval? And uh, so that's maybe a dimension that 
you haven't uh, addressed here in the past. Any special considerations in addition to the general ones that you outlined for strategic relocation and so on uh, for either widows or single women who are trying to find a safe place uh, going forward? Well, people, um, widows or single women, depends a lot on what their ability to do normal repairs and, and, and be tool savvy are. There are some women who are really very savvy about tools and can repair things as well as a man. If you're not one of those people, you are going to have to depend on a network of people that you develop. So it isn't so much the place, although you need to follow the general recommendations of getting out of the urban areas um, to be in a more rural community, but then you immediately need, once you get a, a safer city to live in, to establish church relationships. Um, if you're in work, you know, anybody that you, in conservative clubs and other things, you've got to provide a network of people that can help and, and help you uh, uh, in times. And there are a lot of people in that situation. There are a lot of people who call to me and, and say, you know, what do I do if I'm an apartment dweller? I said, well, you got to remember, there's still about five to eight years maybe before this crisis comes. You've got time to change your situation. So don't be caught in this attitude that I'm helpless, I can't do anything. You have some time to start to rearrange, whether that's relocation or getting a new set of friends and, and really working towards, I mean, even a single woman has to depend on men to some extent. And she may not want to deal with single men, but, you know, finding a nice couple that you get along with to help out, that's a possibility. But, you know, conservative organizations, churches and uh, um, other community type of organizations that, are, that, are, that tend to attract, uh, you know, there are preparedness groups in something. I, I'm very reluctant because preparedness groups tend to want to share all their information about what you've got and, mm. and and that's a problem. It really is a problem because in preparedness groups, I have found they all tend to latch on to the wealthiest, most prepared person. And while they may not say it, they're all planning on showing up at his doorstep when they run out of food. So you've got to be very careful about sharing your preparation in, in a group, a preparedness group. In terms of the what we're preparing for, there's lots of different possibilities. You've got a particular um, scenario that you've described in high in high level terms uh, a couple of times, but a lot of people are obviously are currently concerned about the potential for bioweaponized um, uh, illnesses, that sort of thing. Uh, we have a viewer uh, with the name of Charm, and I can't pronounce the rest of it. Does the military have the strength to combat a bioweaponized pandemic? I also wanted to tag on the end of that. My wife and I are chronic Lyme. Uh, survivors, and there's a current uh, uh, bill before the uh, U.S. Congress requesting that the military inform Congress on whether or not they were, in fact, experimenting with ticks on Plum Island uh, at the time. You know, now it's near Lyme, Connecticut, which is why it's called Lyme disease, etc. So anyway, your your thoughts on whether our country and the military have, have the preparedness to be able to combat a bioweaponized pandemic? No government has the weapons or material to combat a pandemic. And that's one of the greatest dangers of biowarfare is how to contain it within the target country without it blowing back against you. Look at China, for example. This was clearly a weaponized virus done in the Wuhan Bio4 lab. It, is, <coughs> it escaped, <coughs> most likely through... Uh, improper disposal of the gloves that they use and other suits that were scavenged by, you know, there's a whole scavenger community in China and they probably scavenged hundreds of thousands of gloves and sold them to the fish market and that's how it got spread around. But this is what countries like that deserve. Now, to be true, the United States still has a bioweapons program. They claim that they aren't doing, that they've dismantled that, um, but it's not true. They've got a bioweapons, they've still got a chemical weapons, well, so does Russia, so does China. So this is a very real threat when these things escape. And there's only one defense of that, and that is to self-isolate. Another reason to have relocated to a smaller rural community. Don't go to church, don't go to work, don't let your kids play with other kids. I mean, you must be very, very strict about those. And then you take the preventatives. In the World Affairs Brief for the past two or three weeks, we put out some of the best herbal remedies, one of the 
probably the most potent is what's called fire cider. Uh, you can find that on the internet, um, but it is a combination of uh, garlic, horseradish, uh, cayenne pepper, you know, all these very hot, potent ginger root and other things. And you seep it in apple cider vinegar for about a month and then pour off the, the, the solids and you've got this juice left over. And believe me, I have used it. And I was waiting for you to say when you're going to put cold. the fireball whiskey in there. <laughs> But it's powerful. Vitamin D3 is important. Even uh, bentonite clay is important in a very liquid, uh, diluted form. It absorbs viruses in the, the tract and thing when you, when you swallow it. So we've given a lot of advice in the World Affairs Brief of how you prepare for those things. Uh, if you think you're going to go to the hospital during a pandemic and use the traditional antiviral drugs, you're in for a rude awakening because the hospitals are going to be packed. You're going to get even more deeply infected. In fact, the latest uh, data from a doctor in China said the reinfection rate is more deadly than the initial. In other words, if you get it twice after recovering, it's almost always fatal. That shows a sign of a weaponized virus. So You've got to be very careful. You've got to remember to don't depend on the government. Don't depend on their quarantines. The worst thing you want to do is get into a government quarantine where you're in with hundreds of other infected people. I mean, can you imagine a worse situation? They won't let you leave. You've got to stay out of everything. Don't ever get captured and put in. It's like Hurricane Katrina. Don't go to a FEMA camp. They won't let you out. Wow. You also mentioned earlier about uh, you think that financial collapse will not be the mechanism by which our lives are most likely disrupted in the near term. However, you did mention that we are riding on the surface of a bubble which is being uh, frantically reinflated by the Fed. And now today the announcement came out, or yes, last night, I guess, from the Chinese central bank going to be cutting rates and, and, and uh, quantitatively eating as, easing as well. Um, we have a question from Hike Frost, or Heike Frost who says, when gold and silver increase in price substantially and in value, I'm sure you agree that keeping it secret that you have this asset is paramount. How then do you think we will be able to take advantage of our purchasing power to buy certain things at the same time keeping a very low profile? Good question. I uh, have gold and silver as well. Uh, they've been manipulated downward. And it's only you know gone up you know a, sig a fair amount. Uh, Gold has, you know, uh, been allowed to rise, but it's still not anywhere near what it should in comparison to the inflation rate of the dollar. For example, we found out that during the 2008 uh, mortgage crisis, the Fed inflated through the banks over $16 trillion. It wasn't $800 billion, right. it was $16 right. trillion. Dollars. And so you've got to remember that didn't even show up as major inflation. And that's one of the reasons why I keep telling people the dollar supply is much, much bigger than the petrodollar. It's much, much bigger than people think. The Fed is creating trillions of dollars monthly and spreading it to Europe to keep those banks. In, the, in fact, the money supply is so big that when they throw out $20 trillion, it doesn't even have a blip. That tells you how big the money supply is. And so don't underestimate the Fed's ability to continue to uh, support the bubble without inflation, without hyperinflation. Because remember, it takes indexing to get to hyperinflation. It takes perceivable, where people are starting to panic, and then the government steps in and, and raises everybody's salaries in proportion to inflation, and then it really takes off. Without indexing, you cannot get to hyperinflation. You only get to stagflation, get up to 15, 20% inflation, and people can't buy anymore, or at least, and that's what takes the bubble the air out of the bubble. But remember that if you've got gold and silver, in my opinion, you want to liquidate it, uh, except for your uh, silver dollars, which are your best barter coin, liquidate all the gold before war. And the reason I say that <clears throat> is because the dollar bill will be king when war, the government is going to be printing anything. Can you imagine trying to buy a loaf of bread with a $20 gold piece that's worth $2,000 and getting change for it? It's just not going to work. It's not going to work. You're not. People don't know how to value gold. There's no way that they're going to give you change for it. It's just not going to work except for silver dollars. That's It's a big, fat, heavy, beautiful coin. 
that you can get people to say that's worth 15 bucks, but you're not going to be able to get people to buy into a gold coin. They don't know if it's counterfeit. For, you... for Certainly for everyday barter situations, I, I'm following you, and that's exactly what a lot of our guests have said is that whether junk silver that people can recognize because it's it, they recognize it as from the past, it's the real deal, or whether uh, U.S. silver eagles, that sort of thing, um, are, are going to be highly valuable for barter. Um, but it would be a very different type of reason that people would be trying to preserve uh, capital in in uh, gold coinage that, that they would then hope to be able to uh, come back to after after things settle down, not to use it for barter, for sure. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, to survive the war and to use it afterwards, mm -hmm. still, it's, it's you have to wait till the market gets reestablished, the, the, the actual business market for selling gold and silver. And that really would take not not only during war but after war. Now, even in World War II, gold was good for buying your liberty, for example, if you had to bribe somebody. You know, a lot of people used gold coins or silver to get out of Nazi Germany. A lot of the Jews uh, did that, for example. So there is something to be said for that. Uh, but they had to pay a tremendous premium for that. They had to give away, you know, 300% of the value in order, in order to... to get out of those situations. It's just not a good, the point is, you want to eliminate, when war comes, you want to eliminate your need for money so that you've stockpiled most everything you need for a year. Now, if you've got the facilities to do that, that's fine. But for that, what you don't have, I'll tell you, dollar bills are still going to be king because there's, everybody recognizes it. Nobody's printing any more during the first year of the war, et cetera. So you don't have to worry about hyperinflation. But believe me, if you've got dollar bills, they're still going to be able to buy things and whatever is there. So you ought to stockpile dollar bills uh, in in small demand. Nothing, you know, a few hundred dollar bills and things, but mostly twenties and tens and fives, so that you can, you know, have small denominations to buy things. So. Um, and keep the silver in the domination. I don't think junk silver, by the way, is going to be a very good barter coin because it's used coinage. It's going to be very difficult to point to people to the edge and say, you see, there's silver, you know, in there, and it's, um, it's, you know, I've got some of that. But I think the full silver coin, the silver eagles, are going to be your top, uh, your top barter thing. It's interesting to try to theorize what will be the most well recognized. Um, in the case of paper dollars. Are, do you have any concern about uh, cash bans or the cashless society? We've spoken with John Adams, an economist from Australia, where there's cash restriction laws being put in place. Uh, I've got close acquaintances from India whose family had to actually go in and turn in all their old, they had safes full of cash, had to turn them in to get new cash issued from the government. Uh, uh, any concerns about the, the any hoarded dollars that people may be accumulating becoming uh, obsolete because they're the old, the old version and that's not allowed anymore? Well, you take what happened in Argentina, for example, in the year 2000, when the banking system went down and you couldn't even use credit card. Now, you think about that. If you couldn't use, you talk about a cash society and the internet goes down and nothing works at a, at a pay thing, uh, that's what's going to happen someday. During war, after an EMP strike, there's not going to be any credit card that's going to be useful. And so what else is there? Even if there's a ban on cash, you still hoard cash because when you pull out those dollars, when nothing else works, people are going to take it. Believe me, people will take the dollars even if they're illegal, especially if they're illegal. And so there's just no way. And in fact, that's one of the reasons that the Fed, you notice that they've never recalled any dollars. The old fashioned currency is still good when they print a new Except for the larger denominations, because I got bit by that one one time. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the $500,000 yeah, yeah. bill, that's one thing, yeah. But anything $100 bill, they've never disallowed any other $100 bill cash, even the old old ones. Hmm. Uh, they don't go out of date. And, uh, and part of the reason is because they know that people have hoarded $100 bills all around the world. During the Argentine crisis, when the banks completely shut down, over $50 billion of American currency came out of the mattresses of Argentine people to spring alive the economy. $50 billion. 
And they're doing the same in Lebanon, in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in Germany, in France. Everybody's hoarding dollars. And that's so that's where the money supply is just uh, huge. But it's going to be king when more comes because they won't be printing any more for a while. We have been speaking with Joel Skousen, author of Strategic Relocation and the Secure Home. Joel, you've uh, given you've whetted people's appetite that a new version of your Strategic Relocation book is due out this middle of 2020. Any last thoughts before we let you go? Well, just remember, nobody's going to save us. We have to save ourselves. So. Everybody keep busy and keep listening to your podcast. You do a great job, Dunningham. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for being here, Joel. All right. They say the stock market crashed today. Yeah, I heard that. Sounds like people's retirement accounts and savings accounts are going to get bailed into the banks. Yeah. Looks like pension plans and social security are going to get suspended too. I know. Sure, I'm glad we decided to put our money into gold and silver instead. Me too. Get your gold and silver and support this channel at goldsilver.com slash question mark AFF equals RP. Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions.